Hello everyone, this is my standard sound check. Please, uh, can you let me know if you can hear this? Hopefully I've got on top of the, uh, the couple of technical gremlins that I've had, namely Lightroom not wanting to start and uh, the output monitoring of sound from, for me uh, wasn't working either. So let me know if you can hear this and if you can, uh, it's all systems go for 7.30 and I'll see you then.
Good evening, one and all, and welcome to In Studio Live, the 29th iteration of uh, this live stream. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, right, let's uh, get off to a quick start tonight. I'm trying very hard not to look at the chat just at the moment uh, because I'm suspecting there's going to be yet more puns about windows and doors. For those who aren't aware, um, there's been, um, there was a photograph posted in the Facebook group uh, this week of a uh, shuttered up window and uh, there are an awful lot of puns being uh, uh, posted on that and there's various uh, things go going on in the chat. I can see out of the corner of my eye, I think, about that. Well, no, maybe they're not. Um, right, anyway, welcome to, the, uh, welcome to the show. Let's just get underway and uh, start by doing the usual uh, welcome, everyone, especially if you're watching this for the first time, maybe on replay, maybe uh, live. Uh, if you're not familiar with the format here, they are weekly shows in full on live on YouTube for a while, then they get cut down, put into my academy and highlights put up onto YouTube. At least that's the theory. I'm a little bit behind. I am trying my best to sort that out at the moment. Uh, if you've got any questions, I have a couple of spots within the, uh, the live stream for live Q&A. So ask your questions in the chat. If you're watching on the replay, ask them in the, uh, the comments uh, on there. Or indeed, you can email me them during the week. Uh, please take a moment to subscribe. I really appreciate it for uh, the subscribers. I've still got uh, a long way to go to, to reach my goal of a thousand subscribers. Um, please comment on the videos when you're able to, anything that you watch, and uh, please take a moment to hit the like button. I see some of you are already ahead of the game and there's seven likes already being registered uh, on there, and please share the videos. So that's the general thing. A couple of other things just to let you know about. The Facebook group that I referred to earlier, uh, here's the link to it. It's um, generally a photo sharing and photo advice group. It's open to all uh, and uh, it's actually even open to models as well and I'm, I am, I'm hoping to try and get a little bit more interaction with the models uh, over the next couple of weeks in there. Uh, so uh, if you're not a member of that and you're on Facebook please please do join and uh, also another thing just to say I've, I, I discovered this week uh, while I was trying to do some tagging that was one or two people that I interact with on the group who aren't on my friends list. So if you like to be a friend and you're in the, the group already and I'm, I'm not a friend, then please send me a friend request. I'm, uh, uh, I'll be friends with anyone. Yeah, anyone? Uh, no. Uh, so, yep, that's the Facebook group. Great place to share your photos, uh, find out what's going on uh, with the live stream uh, and to continue the conversation from... Uh, uh, from Sunday night. I have a newsletter, link to that is down below the video, also up on the screen now, and the link to the Facebook group is also down in the video below, so um, please take a look at those. Right, that's the, the standard introduction. I think I'm getting a bit quicker with that each week. So what have we got this week? A little bit of news go coming up. Uh, we are finally going to complete our series on wildlife photography. I'm going to look at some of your images, both the uh, non-wildlife ones and the, uh, the wildlife ones. And I've just realized, as I said that, there's something I should have done to the images and haven't. So that'll be interesting when we get to that segment. Uh, and of course, the live Q&A on there. Uh, I've mentioned it before, the events are back. I'm in the process of organizing the next couple at the moment. Those who are waiting to hear from me, you should get an email from me in the next couple of days about the uh, uh, about uh, the events that you said you've expressed an interest in. Uh, the One 2020 Challenge has been going on during the week. Uh, I've been seeing the photos uh, come in. Uh, really, um, really like what, looking at, uh, well, I've not gone through them all in detail yet. This week I'll convert them into slideshows and next week uh, will be a chance to, uh, to see what you've all been working on. And I'll go through them both as a slideshow and then pick out a few highlights as well on that. If anyone wants to send me any thoughts they've had about the, uh, 
the, the challenge, lessons that they learnt and things like that, then please do and I'll uh, read them out or include it if it's a video um, next time round uh, as we go through these uh, because the whole purpose of it is to help you uh, improve with your photography on there. So thanks to everyone who's submitted so far and has been doing it. Um, please use uh, wetransfer.com if you can to let me have the images and I'll get them all sorted ready for next week. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with what the challenge is all about, it's basically, it, you've got two hours, that's the 120, 120 minutes, to take 20 photographs. So there's a catch. There's no deletions, so there's got to be consecutive frames, no retakes, so every shot should be a different subject, and you agree to show the images at the end. It's putting a little bit of pressure on you, taking you back to the old film days where every shutter click had a price on it, had a cost to it. So that's the idea behind it. If you want full details and example, if you look back a couple of um, live shows ago, I run through it in a bit more detail and explain uh, what it's all about and how you can take part uh, on there. All right. Um, so add any questions uh, that you've got into the chat. As I've said, uh, there is a delay typically um, 30 seconds to two minutes from me speaking to you hearing me, uh, which does mean that occasionally uh, the questions pop up after I've moved on from a section. I'm just gonna have a look what's actually in chat at the moment. He says, hoping he presses the right button. Yes, so what have we got? Um, um, right. Uh, Michael, having been through a few of yesterday's 305 images. Great. Well done, my Michael. It, remember, it's not about quantity, it's about quality on there. And the trick is to uh, pull, them, pull them down. Yeah, good evening to Bob and Richard, who've joined since uh, I was able to. Um, right. Oh, here's an interesting question. Um, from Michael, if I've got a 10 minute slot with a model, um, what would I shoot pose wise? Right, I mean, it, it does depend on uh, a lot of factors. I'm in a slightly different position in that just about every pose I can think of these days, I've probably shot umpteen times. But if I, was, if I got 10 minutes and I was trying to do something for the model's portfolio, well, first of all, I'd, I'd be thinking about um, what, what is it that she needs for a portfolio? And typically, um, oh, right, well, a little bit more information uh, in here. Um, it's a shoot with three models individually, lingerie to topless, and a group shoot for 20 minutes. Right. I would say, first things to concentrate on, one of the things I always do at the beginning of a shoot is I try to get a one decent sort of headshot. Uh, now, whether that's um, for, with, usually, if I was restricted on time, I would use whatever lighting I'm using. I would set something up that I could do headshots, three-quarter length and full length. So I wouldn't have to waste time on the lighting. I would look at, um, I would try and get that mix, headshot, three-quarter length and full length on there. Um, it also would depend on who the model is and what sort of skills they are. There's the old uh, photographers get out of jail free card and just ask your model to work through uh, a number of poses. Uh, but if you're looking for something unique out of 10 minutes and you, you want to do just so sort of freestyle it, one little trick that I've done uh, in the studio is I find some absolutely bizarre prop or a, a little selection of them and I just spend two minutes 
with the model and just say, right, we've got two minutes to just do as many poses and use these props in any bizarre way that you can. And the majority of those images will be rubbish, but one or two, an idea will just come out. And it might be using something in a way you hadn't thought of, uh, the model posing in a way that she hadn't thought of. It's a sort of a visual form of brainstorming. And then as you quickly look through those poses, identify that one or two items that um, they thought, oh, that was interesting. And then spend the rest of your 10 minutes trying to hone in on that and do something with that. That way you've got something that's different uh, from, the, from that limited 10 minutes. If you can't do that, I would start headshot three quarter length, full length, and try and work with the model to come up with a number of poses on there. I'm guessing with that sort of length of time, you're not gonna be changing your lighting much. So light for full length and then just crop in to, to do other, um, uh, other positions. The other thing to think about with it, I don't know how much control you'll have of the lighting, but one of my uh, sort of favorite tricks, for those who've been to studio events, you'll have probably seen me do this, uh, is that I'm a big fan of uh, rim lighting. So a lot of my lighting setups have a rim light somewhere in there. And one of the things I will do towards the end, if, I'm, if I want to get a completely different look, is I'll turn off the key light and get the model to turn her face so that the rim light is illuminated. And it's usually in silhouette at that, either in silhouette or in profile. And it just gives a very, it's a very quick way of getting apparently a very different lighting setup from the same lighting setup where all you have to do is turn off your, your key light. So think about doing things like that um, on there. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of brainstorming um, ideas, uh, probably about 10 minutes worth, actually. Uh, so I hope that's helped you, uh, uh, Michael, and giving you a few ideas on there. Um, uh, and hopefully, oh, show us what you actually come up with in your 10 minutes when you, when you do it. Share, share the images in the group um, uh, on that. Uh, as long as it, in the Facebook group, so long as they are Facebook friendly, as a note, you mentioned there was uh, potentially some topless um, there. If you want to share the topless ones, then if you have a look at my website and go to the communities there, there's um, uh, must get it set up in the next day or so. Um, a group there for images that can be shared for the in connection with the live stream uh, so that you can safely upload the topless ones to there. And then you can put a link in the Facebook group to them, but please don't have the images in there, even the, the, um, the preview image. Otherwise we, we potentially get in trouble with Facebook uh, on that. And I, I don't want to get into trouble and uh, uh, I don't want the group, uh, I don't want you to get into trouble either, but uh, feel free to share them that way if they're not Facebook friendly uh, on that. Okay, I think that was all the questions I got in, um, uh, in chat at the moment. So uh, let's move on. Yeah, if you have any more questions during the week, please send them to me at contact me at ians-studio.co.uk. I don't think I had any this week. Um, if I did, my apologies to whoever sent them. I don't recall any um, on that this week. Um, right, let's uh, head on to our how not to shoot wildlife um, uh, chat um, for this evening. I'm going to split it into two halves. Uh, there was the potential for moving this into a fourth week, but I thought I, I really want to move on from wildlife and, and do some get the one 2020 uh, underway and move on to a few other things. So I've got two shorter sections that I'm going to talk this week. Uh, with a couple of things in between. So how not to shoot wildlife. It's designed as a lighthearted talk, as I think many of you know. It's split over three live streams. Uh, we've looked at equipment. We started looking last week at technique, and it was originally created as a talk on the cruisers. 
Um, and so we're looking through technique, and here's one that you may or may not be aware of. It's not one I've done myself yet, and I keep promising myself I'll set up for this uh, using our, uh, our bird feeder. Um, consider using flash when photographing birds. Um, either remote flash, so it's in where they are, or using a means of focusing the light so it goes further. Um, the reason for it is, is twofold. Often birds will settle in shady areas and getting that extra bit of light in there can help uh, the images. Uh, but also it makes the colors much more vibrant if you can do that. Um, the other thing to watch is be careful of the bird equivalent of red eye, uh, which is actually steel eye. If you get it bouncing from the, uh, the flash into the eye and back again. Um, right, uh, so just be aware of that. I, I'm just pausing at the moment because I just spotted a, a chat item come in. Gary was asking about the vignetting tool and the three options it offers. Ah, darn. Uh, yes, I had forgotten about that one, Gary. I will do it next week because I need to have the images to explain that. Uh, which is why I couldn't, I didn't answer online. Uh, sorry about that little diversion on there, but I thought I'd just mention that now while I remember. Um, the other way, uh, going back to uh, flash and birds, is have you ever seen those uh, Fresnel lens magnifying glasses? They're like a sheet of perspex that you can put over a book or a magazine, and it just makes everything bigger. Now. Apparently, you can use one of those to focus and to uh, a, a flash. Now, you can already do that on most flash guns by changing the, the zoom level of it. So you can go from a sort of wide angle through to maybe 105 millimeter. But then adding the Fresnel lens in front of that will actually zoom it even further, which allows that light into a narrower beam. Therefore, it's brighter at a further distance, so it carries further. So that's something else to, to have a think about with there. As part of all that, the idea of using remote triggering. If you don't have a telephoto lens, maybe put your camera in close where you know the animals are going to be. You can sit at a distance and trigger it remotely. Now, there are a number of reasons you might want to do this. This is sometimes done with uh, certain sports. Uh, horse racing is the classic one, the shot of the camera just be low down near the fence as the horses are jumping over a wide angle. It works, um, uh, works really well on that. But you can do it with wildlife. Get the camera set up, you retire to a safe distance, or safe for the birds, so that they will come. And then you can just trigger the, uh, the camera uh, at that point. Now, if you've got... Um, the ability to trigger with a live view, you've got a tethering that allows you to do that. Uh, Capture One um, will allow you to do it at the moment. I'm sure it won't be long before uh, Lightroom will, uh, will have that kind of uh, functionality in there. Uh, they're, they're, all, they're always playing catch up on that. Um, you'd be able to see when the bird's in the right place on the feeder or in a nesting box or on a bird table or something like that and capture those sort of those uh, sort of um, um, images. Um, and some triggers like the uh, the Yonganuo ones will allow you to trigger both the flash and the camera at the same time. So again, have a think about that for, um, uh, for wildlife photography. Now, Insects and butterflies, you may need macro lenses for that, fairly obvious, but you can also, as I explained last week, you can use camera phones for that. And you saw some of those um, uh, shots I did where I was just putting the phone next to an insect uh, upside down to, to get the, uh, the image. Uh, so think about that for uh, insects and butterflies. Uh, here, this actually one, this was one taken with a, with a long lens. Uh, I was in the Amazon rainforest. I was struggling to get the, um, uh, the size of the whole thing. So actually, I just got out my, my long lens and just got this close-up of, um, of a butterfly uh, in the forest. 
to sort of try and tell the story that way. And this is one of my favourite shots. Um, uh, it was on board um, the MV Magellan, uh, for those of you on here who would know that, Richard Lovelock, for example. Uh, they, they, we had a problem at going into the Amazon with all these moths and butterflies appearing and insects appearing, and they had to close off the exterior doors for the, uh, for the restaurant. And this sign was put up there, and it just looked as though the, uh, the moth was having a read of the sign. So one of my favourites, that one uh, on there. This moth um, leads me into something that we need to think about when uh, photographing smaller creatures. How big do you think the image is? It just looks like a moth, a butterfly. But if I was to tell you that actually it's about the size of my hand, uh, maybe even slightly larger than that, uh, it's a shame I couldn't get anything into that shot to give it a sense of scale. The same with this beetle. I mean, any idea how big that is? I mean, it's a beetle. How big can it be? About so big, do you think? Or do you think it might be a little bit bigger? Maybe about that big? I don't know. Well, I have to tell you, it was a big beetle. To give it some size, sort of scale, that card is my boarding card on the ship, and it's the size of um, a credit card. Maybe a little bit bigger because when I put my phone next to it, and just to show you, that's my phone. That's the phone. Uh, so we've got a beetle here, which is the same size of my phone uh, on there. So that's the importance of having something to give a sense of scale uh, with um, the smaller creatures. Uh, although this is my favorite shot from uh, that setup. This was actually all, all taken at midnight and uh, I was, had um, off camera flash illuminating the whole thing. But it was a beetle with a, a great sense of uh, self-preservation because it positioned itself next to a sign saying, watch your step. Obviously, they didn't want to get trodden on. Next, think about the habitat of the creatures that you're pho uh, photographing. Uh, don't just restrict yourself to the animals themselves. Uh, even the, where they live can be interesting. So for example, here we've got termites and termite nest in the Amazon, very close to where I photographed the butterfly, actually, um, on there. So I thought that was fascinating. It helps tell the story. I didn't manage to get much of the termites, but I did get their uh, environment. And then the, um, the spider's web as well, again, tells the story. Now, this would have been better if I could have got the spider on there as well, but I didn't. Another thing to think about with um, wildlife photography I can't remember whether I've mentioned this previously or not, but it's an important um, little point. Many animals uh, feel threatened when they see a human being. There are, it's almost into their DNA now that a human shape is threatening. So if you can break that shape up, the idea of camouflage on there, um, but even just crouching or kneeling or sitting will remove that outline that's uh, sort of programmed into the brain and will enable you to get a little bit closer to the uh, animal that you're photographing. Uh, on there, so crouch, sit or lie uh, to avoid that. And of course, be patient. Now, this is why I don't do much in terms of uh, wildlife photography. I am not patient. I can't spend hours just sitting waiting for the, the right animal to turn up. Uh, but you may need multiple visits to a location to actually get the image that, uh, that you're after. Uh, one of the, uh, the people who's been regularly posting in the Facebook group, who does watch this, but not always live, um, um, he's off-grid off to, um, tonight, John Bamber, um, he will, spend literally hours and hours just waiting. And some of the images that he posted in the group this week are the result of that patience. 
uh, where he will set up in a location knowing that if he waits there long enough, the animal that he wants to photograph will eventually turn up. So a lot of patience required. In fact, I first met John um, on, uh, on one of the cruisers, spending hours on board the ship. And you may need to spend hours at the front of a ship just to get the images that you're looking for. If you're prepared to wait, you will get some interesting shots. And this is the most interesting shot I ever got at the front of a ship. That's because I'm not patient enough. Actually, I do quite like that shot of all the photographers looking, and that's on the Amazon. We've just come on onto the Amazon, heading, uh, uh, heading upstream, as it were, on there. Uh, so another thing about animals and photography, and this is not so much... <sighs> There are some people who photograph animals not because they're photo photographers and they're not actually too bothered about the image and getting it uh, absolutely spot on and tack sharp. And that is because they're more interested in seeing the animals but using the images for identification um, uh, and, and so that they can uh, they know what they have seen. And that's a whole different sort of subject really. Uh, the, the purpose of the image is just to get enough information to do the identification, which means the image doesn't have to be the best quality, it doesn't have to be the best, uh, it doesn't have to be tack sharp, it doesn't have to be well composed, it just needs to be have enough information on there. But if you are a photographer and you want to identify the image, sometimes the shot, the keeper shots, don't have all the information that you want for identification. Um, when I was trying to identify some of the birds I photographed, there was uh, one set that I got uh, that the, the guy who was doing the identification for me said, uh, can't tell you what that is. You haven't got its feet on any of the images. And the distinguishing feature between two different um, birds that it could have been was the color of the feet. So sometimes you need to keep other images, um, the, the ones which are not the good images, just for purposes of identification, so that you know what it is you photographed uh, on there. So bottom line, don't delete the images until you've actually done that identification. And as I said, you may need more than one image because the shot, the keeper shot, may not have everything visible on there. Uh, as I already said. So here we go. Uh, just to give you an, Id uh, an idea of how this works, we've got um, a bird, we've got a creature, we've got um, yellow feet, we've got a black beak, we've got yellow round the eyes, and after some extensive research, I can categorically now tell you it's a bird. Actually, I... Um, Richard Lovelock's probably going to tell me in a moment what it actually is. I think it's a snowy egret. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong on that, uh, on there. And this was, a, again, what, another example of why you would need more than one um, uh, image for it. This is a green heron. It didn't look like a heron to me when I started photographing it. And this is the best image, but the next shot's in some ways the more interesting image because it can extend its neck. And this was, I was just staggered when I saw this. Go back, that, that bird with that little neck, I was watching it and the neck just suddenly grew and grew and grew until it was that size on there. Quite incredible to watch. Um, again, back to the idea of identification. This one is not sharp. Uh, but it's enough to be able to identify it. Unfortunately, nobody yet has been able to identify it, uh, but it's got all the features on there. I believe it's a damselfly, but that's about all I know on that one. Um, but sometimes, two, as I mentioned, two creatures, particularly birds, can look alike. Um, uh, oh, I've just been told on the chat that I was correct. It was a snowy, 
uh, a snowy egret uh, on there. Right, um, yeah, it can be difficult to tell the difference between two species. For example, here's one I always get confused with. Uh, we've got a stalk and we've got some butter. Uh, I, I always have trouble telling the difference between the two. Okay, right, sorry. Sorry about that joke, folks. All right, let's move over. Actually, what I'm going to do at this point, I'm going to move on. I'm going to skip the feedback for one moment because there's something I need to do in Lightroom uh, to, to enable that. It'll only take me a minute or two. So while I'm doing that, Let's um, go behind the scenes with, um, with Michael. He very kindly posted a, um, a short behind the scenes uh, video of one of his shoots. Um, he posted it on uh, YouTube, shared it in the, uh, the Facebook group. I took a look at it and I thought, no, that'd, be a, that'd be a nice image to, uh, to share with you all uh, tonight. Uh, a nice not image, a nice little video. It's only a couple of minutes long, so uh, over over to that. Um, but just to say, the links to Michael's YouTube channel are down below in the description. So if you like the video and like what Michael shared there, give him a like on, on there uh, afterwards. Don't, don't go and leave the stream now, but afterwards, go and have a look at his channel and, uh, and subscribe and uh, I'm sure he'd appreciate that uh, and you'll get to see um, some of his other stuff on there. Some, some interesting stuff actually Michael's been posting there so do have a look at it all uh, on that. So I will leave you with that while I set Lightroom up for a few minutes. Let's get this right.
right, thank you for, uh, for sharing that with us, uh, Michael. And um, hopefully uh, everyone found it uh, just an interesting little diversion and it enabled me to set Lightroom up correctly for what I wanted to do. And uh, also allowed me to have a, a swig of my tea. Uh, the last few weeks without having the played in videos, my cup of tea's gone cold by the end of the live stream. Right, okay, here we are over in Lightroom. I just wanted to go through a bit of feedback on some of the images shared in the group this week. Looking at first, this time round, uh, the non-wildlife images, and then uh, right at the, after the, well, a little bit later on, I'll do the, uh, the wildlife ones and talk about those. So let's go into the develop module. Actually, can I do it? Uh, there we go, full screen on that. Um, yeah, this one from John, um, who I believe is watching. I noticed a comment in the Facebook group on there. Uh, black and white church, nighttime one. Um, I think you know what my feedback's going to be on this one, John. It's the, the usual thing, just that little bit late in the day on there. Uh, some of the detail is there, though because I can bring up that detail behind, but we're losing a lot on the highlights and I can't really do too much about bringing that back. I think it was overexposed to start with and that was blown out on there. Also think about your lens corrections with that. Um, on that one, um, on there, so it's, that's the usual. Again, another one of John's, um, uh, I've included this one in here simply because it's Chester um, and it's the bridge and I have, um, I'm reluctant to say fond memories uh, of, uh, of this uh, location, but last time I was there uh, was I think about 24 miles into a marathon that I was running and um, that's going back. Uh, about six years now. Um, hope one day to get myself back to marathon fitness. Uh, but uh, interesting shot uh, with that. I like the um, the framing on there. Uh, the one thing I would say is just be a bit careful with this wall on here, um, John. Uh, I just wonder whether we could just do that with it and lose the wall. It's a shame to lose a bit of the trees on there, but the wall just didn't seem to be adding much to the shot uh, on that one. Uh, again, another one from, from John, a little quick bit of feedback um, on this one. Um, it's a couple of things to watch. First of all, the horizon's not straight. That needs straightening up on there. And second, this is one where a low angle really would have helped because the most of that silhouette is getting lost in the uh, the dark area of the image uh, down here. Um, so you end up with something, you end up with losing that outline a little bit. So by going lower, uh, you would put the uh, the silhouette against the brighter sky on, uh, on that. Uh, if you, the the avatar that I use, not the studio one, but for myself, you, you'll have seen it on Facebook. Um, if you think about where the horizon line is on that shot, um, if you follow that kind of approach, you'd have got a better shot with that. And it'd have been a really interesting image, um, but I think just too much dark on the bottom section on there. I think the less said about this, the better after the conversation in the Facebook group about all the puns about uh, 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 about uh, uh, would this have been a good image and uh, the frame of it uh, and all those sorts of things on there. Uh, actually, uh, in all fairness, it is a nice shot, uh, Peter. It's an interesting shot. A couple of things just to watch with it. And one is lens corrections on here. It's suffering from... Um, pincushion distortion. Can you see how these lines are moving in on there? So I don't think we can get 
and we get no it doesn't know what that is so if i do this can you see how i can correct that and sort of just straighten it up a little bit uh, to avoid that uh, so that might have gone a little bit far on there maybe something like that with it uh, on there and that means those lines are now uh, are now straight um, with it i'd also perhaps be tempted to try and even this up a little bit I'd like to see a little bit more up at the top of the well rather than me bringing in i'd like to see about that much left and right all the way around and the same at the top uh, just to balance that image on the on the crop uh, with that one but no more window puns uh, and a similar door one uh, all um, uh, shuttered up um, boarded up on there again I quite like that I think that's again I think it just needs that little bit of space at the very top there because that's your border I think I just like to see the equivalent a little bit higher if you could on that one but leaving the bit down below with the handle and the lock is is spot on that's well framed on a, on there um this one i think is also um chesto which makes me wonder whether that one i've highlighted of john's may be one of andy's uh maybe i no i don't know anyway it's also chester uh i believe um and again i just ah that's the reason i picked on it <laughs> i was just thinking i didn't remember it looking quite like that yeah it was this this figure down here um i think is interesting now i know andy's not watching live tonight um but will be watching um later but the figure down here i think it's just getting a little bit close to the bottom here i'd just like to see a little bit more space at the bottom of the image on that one uh, and that's just a niggle on there and that's all um with that one um or trying to perhaps focus more on this guy uh, maybe something i don't know i should have thought this one through first but something like that makes him more the focus of attention than just an element in the, in the image on there. So moving on. I like this one, Andy. Um, I would, I'd be tempted to give it a title of and run dot dot dot. Um, it just looks like the whole thing is launching straight at this guy and he's having to leg it out of the way. I'm sure what it is, is that foreshortening effect that's causing it. Uh, but interesting shot on there. Thank you for sharing, Andy. Uh, another one of John's. Now, uh, this one, it's very grainy uh, with it. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing on this. To me, it feels just a little too dark, and I'd like to see just a little bit more in there, maybe a bit, a bit more clarity on it, something like that. But I'd also like to have these verticals corrected. I know, I know it's every time I'm saying about verticals, uh, but let's have a go under transform. I'm going to do it as a guided one this time. I'm going to say that's a vertical and that's got to be vertical and then I can crop that in something I'd probably come in that far actually with it and maybe lose a little bit of the gravel at the bottom come up with something like that and that for me I think is a, is a more interesting uh, composition on there now it's it's lost something that noise in there it looks like it's an iPhone type uh, image or maybe your um, uh, Osmo clone um, one John uh, with that so move on 
Uh, another one of John's, I quite like this, but I think it needs less of the dark at the bottom on there, uh, would help it. I would also have moved further to the left to provide separation between the subject and the sun, so that if I, I would choose my position to the left, to the right maybe, whichever way you'd need to go with that, so that the sun appeared at this part of the frame, so that the sun and the, uh, the person were on one third lines, rather than both over to one side. That's a, a nitpick uh, on there, uh, rather than anything major. Right, this is again another of John's, but it was this one or that one. I'm, I'm going to go with the, um, uh, the orangey one, and it would be a quick correction of the horizon. And I would say what it does need, maybe just a fraction more on the saturation or vibrance on there, something like that. And I would try and preserve the highlights or the whites on there so that that's not blown out much. Mm, touch on the shadows maybe. Something like that. Now, I know you've not got Lightroom, John, but the same sort of techniques, I'm sure, are possible in, uh, in Affinity uh, on there. This one from Mike Ashcroft. Now, Mike is one of the people I challenged this week. I've started each week picking on people in the group, particularly people who haven't been active, to try and bring them back into the, um, uh, into the Facebook group. And Mike was somebody who... Um, I think I've met Mike on a, a cruise from memory and uh, he'd not posted anything in the group for a long time. So I tagged him and uh, issued the challenge to him and a few other people uh, to post some stuff this, uh, this week. And uh, he posted this one. It's with an iPhone or a camera phone. Uh, and it's all about just getting the shot at the time. And I really like this. I like the... Uh, the lines leading you into the image, the pose of the child reaching out uh, really works uh, on this. And uh, yeah, I didn't mean that, meant that full screen. Uh, so you can see it a little bit better. I really like it. The only thing I don't like about this, well, two things, is the person in the background um, there with what appears to be a Spider-Man hat on, uh, and the fact that it's not quite vertical, so it just needs those bars turning around like that. And I think that improves it. Uh, if I was willing to spend a long time in Photoshop, I could remove that person from there, but I'm not going to do that tonight um, as part of this. It's uh, just something that I think will, uh, would improve it. But I really do like the light on there, how that whole image works. And another one from Mike. Uh, again, it's a lovely shot, really atmospheric, um, uh, sort of bridal shot that he, he spotted. But I do wonder what this one would look like as a black and white. I'm going over to standard black and white three on there and punch up the clarity on it touch on the exposure and maybe a touch on the shadows and then just bring the highlights back just a fraction on there and I think that makes a great black and white um, uh, image Mike I don't know whether you're watching uh, I if you are watching on the replay then do let me know but I think that uh, I like that I mean, the colour is nice. Let me go full screen for everyone. The colour's nice. I do like it. But for me, I think the black and white uh, just stands out more uh, on that. Um, James, um, uh, this one, I, I was joking about it in the Facebook group uh, you know, during the week. So it just looks like something out of a Jerry Anderson uh, movie, out of Thunderbird, something like that. I think it's a nice shot, and I, I, what I don't know, I think it's a digital shot that's been treated to look like film. The only thing I would do with this is before putting the frame around it, 
I would correct those verticals. So um, it needs just, I'm gonna have to control Z. I'm gonna have to do it with the uh, transform over here and I'll do it guided. That I would want to be vertical. That I want to be vertical. Ooh, that's way, way too much on there. Ugh. Right, this is going to be one that I then need to tilt back a little bit on that. Ooh, I'm having trouble with this one. No, don't like what it's done to it and aspect ratio. Correct the aspect ratio, Y offset to something like that. We're getting there with it. Oops, don't need the X on. Oh, Y offset, bring that up. It's something like that. And then to crop in, I'm afraid I've lost your nice border on there, James, uh, but Oh, you know, I'm not sure. No, I think it works. This is a, a, a difficult one. It really is, because I think the, that change to the aspect ratio needs to go further, and it won't let me uh, on that one. So is it that I've gone too far with that vertical transformation? I thought this was going to be an easy fix, you know. Whenever, whenever I think something's going to be nice and easy, it never is. Yeah, something like that. Um, now let's just have a look at the before and after. Before, after. Oh, I don't know now on that one. Now, of course, the before and after never honours the crop, which is a pain. Um, I'll do it that way that's one before and after oh control no. toggle between before and after you know james i really don't know anymore whether my edit's any good on that one i'll um I'll leave that to you guys to, to decide on there. Another one from John. Uh, this one needs a very quick thing. I, I think it's a little bit underexposed and needs a little bit more vibrance to it. Not much. Yeah, a bit of vibrance on there. But the reason I picked this, because I think we can do something to this that you may not have thought of, and that is... If I can get the menu to go up here, that way, the photo, rotate counterclockwise, photo, retain, rotate counterclockwise. It's one of those, you get a weird effect by flipping sometimes the reflection to see whether, I wonder whether something like that might give you a bit more of an abstract kind of image with it upside down. I'm not sure on this one. It works with some. I think this is just a little bit too dark at the top stroke bottom up here for it to work. I don't know, I think that one would grow on me. So just something to think about with those sorts of images. And is that the last one? Yeah, that's the last one in that set. So back over where I should be on here. That. Let me have a look at the comments. So, what we got in uh, in chat? Um, right. Vignette question. Michael saying that's what he usually does when he's not sure where. Oh, that's the um, the, the shoot. Um, vignette. Oh, right. We've had some feedback from when I was talking in the um, um, 
uh, the wildlife section about uh, using a mini beamer um, to be able to get light further in there. Kev saying that he's used the Magmog version of that flash magnifier. Um, right, they've confirmed my uh, dying, my um, I think about the uh, uh, the bird. Right, Peter saying he's cropped cropped too tight. Yes, uh, Michael saying photograph that building in Media City. I like the abstract patterns. Um, yeah, oh, Kev's pointed out that James has been shooting a lot of film recently, so it could well have been film uh, on that one, which I wasn't sure. If it was, it's a nice shot for film, really is, uh, on, uh, on there. Right, okay, so let's m move on uh, with wildlife photography. So let's carry on with our discussion. Last, final section on this. How am I doing for time? Ooh. I've not run out of the hour yet. I'm just going to look at post-production practice and my favorite uh, topic with wildlife photography, cheating. So a couple of things to think about in post-production, and this is all about cropping in. Uh, it's um, perhaps a little bit more acceptable with wildlife photography than any other uh, genre that you it's accepted that you may have to crop in on the final image because the lens doesn't reach that far. Um, unfortunately, what it does mean is you lose, you're losing pixels, you're losing resolution on there. Now, if you're just gonna be showing the images on a screen, that's not a problem, uh, but you might not be able to do large reprints and you certainly wouldn't be able to sell the stock. Uh, a lot of my wildlife stuff, I can't sell the stock because I'm not in close enough to be able to uh, do it. I've had to crop in a lot with, uh, with my images. So here's, here's an example, uh, a set of uh, puffins on uh, Vigor Island in Iceland. Uh, and that's an okay shot, but be much better when it's cropped in uh, so that the, uh, the puffins are much closer in on the frame on there. Of course, there are a couple of other solutions to, uh, to this problem. If you can't get close enough to uh, your subject because your subject's a bit too small in the distance, you could try finding a bigger puffin um, on there, or one that um, doesn't run away when you do get close, such as this one. And don't worry, it's not dead, it's just pining for the fields. <laughs> Uh, again, use the same sort of technique here with a, a Dunlin uh, on uh, MV Astoria. And this was a crop in, uh, well, it's the closest I could get, and I still had to crop it. But if you don't want to throw pixels away like that, and you don't want to crop in too much, there are a couple of tricks that you can use that will um, really help you with it. And it's, it's more of an optical illusion, really. And that is, choose your crop wisely. This one, where I haven't cropped in, but because there's other elements in there, it actually makes the image work uh, because of the rest of the frame in it. There's something of interest there. In this case, the netting over, uh, over the ship's pool. And a few other ones, like just balancing it off with another object in the frame. Somebody had put... Uh, Oh, the comments, ignore the comment below on that one. That was left from a copy of the slide uh, on there. And again here, uh, we've just got other framing elements in there, which means I don't need to crop all the way in to make the image work. Therefore, I'm saving pixels on there and I've got a higher resolution. So that if I wanted to sell it as stock, that one I could uh, on there. Right, let's look at practice. Um, you don't need to go on safari to be able to improve your wildlife skills. You can practice at home. And you can start off by, well, getting hold of a pet, for example. Um, and here in Montevideo, um, uh, in Uruguay, they appear to be selling garden birds. Um, uh, by the looks of it, 50% off. That's uh, uh, two for the price of one. And... Um, yeah, the, the shopkeeper was a little bit bemused when, um, and, and not, not particularly happy when I, 
I went in there and said that I'd like to get my hands on a pair. Uh, uh, I, I just thought I was getting garden birds. Um, but it's actually amazing what you can get from Amazon these days uh, as well. Uh, okay, let's be serious about this. Working with pets uh, is a good way to hone your skills. And here you can see said cat on a, a cat PlayStation. And the lesson from this is to shoot at the animal's eye level. We always say that about people, and it's the same with wildlife and animals. If you can get in and shoot at their level rather than looking down on them, you'll get a better shot as I, as I achieved here. Uh, and that may mean getting right down on the floor to, uh, to get to the animal's level to actually get the image uh, that you're, you're looking for. But as ever with um, wildlife, timing is everything. So practicing on pets to get that moment and to be ready for the moment and knowing how to, uh, how to capture it uh, is, uh, is good. And the, the, the answer to this one, how was it achieved? We had the owner with a little bit of uh, meat for the, uh, for the, the, the cat, just out, holding it just out of frame, so the cat was reaching up for it. Uh, the little kitten was reaching up for it uh, on there. So another way of practicing is set up a, a bird feeder in the garden uh, and feed the birds regularly. Um, I, always, I always used to say, if you start feeding, you've got to keep it up because they become dependent on it. I was corrected on this by uh, somebody uh, who said, no, it's not quite, they're not, um, um, they're not that dependent on it. They will just move on to, uh, to other areas um, on there. Um, but the one thing I would say about using a bird feeder is it does take time. Uh, if you keep putting food out on a regular basis, the visitors will come. And I've got at home a bird feeder, uh, here it is, that we've been putting stuff out for a good couple of years now. And we get a huge selection of birds coming of lots and lots of different varieties now. Um, from blue tits, great tits, long-tailed tits, cold tits, um, green finch, gold finch um, on there. Uh, yeah, magpies and pigeons, um, dunnocks. Uh, we've had uh, all sorts uh, coming uh, in there. Um, and you can practice on, maybe it is only the pigeons that come at the start, but they're great to, to practice on. Um, uh, to hone your skills, the framing, whether you need to be on continuous and burst mode um, with it. Um, and if necessary, practice on the squirrels as well. They'll come to known feeding locations. Uh, look how thin that one was. Two days later, it was much bigger. <coughs> oh, excuse me, folks. Um, yeah, and you can hone your skills, learn to blur out the background, learn how to get the shutter speed fast enough just by working on a, um, a bird feeder. And if you do have a squirrel problem, I do recommend these domes, these plastic domes that go on the, uh, uh, the, uh, on the feeder. Uh, to uh, prevent the squirrel from getting up there. In fact, this was so funny the first time I put it on there. The squirrel had been going up and down there, and this uh, squirrel rushed up, ended up underneath the dome, and it was going, ooh, ooh, and gradually just sliding down the pole as it was losing, losing its grip because it was relying on the momentum for keeping it moving and keeping it up there. And quite amusing. But patience, um, and perseverance with feeding the birds. And we've had, um, I said, we've had some quite interesting visitors to the garden. Oh yeah, we've had a jay as well, but a great spotted woodpecker um, has visited a few times uh, in, into the garden. And for those of you who know where I live, if one or two of you on here will know, uh, I, I'm quite urban. It, it, is, it is quite urban around our way, 
But we've even had uh, ring neck parakeets uh, coming in uh, a few times. Um, feed, um, and they are wild. They're not just escapees from somebody's uh, house. Um, uh, there's a, a colony of them in the follow on the River Mersey. And they're not too far away, and just occasionally they'll they'll stray uh, up uh, to our neck of the woods. And then you've got the even more rare, the lesser spotted knitted parakeet. Uh, on that. Now let's just talk about zoos and wildlife parks. Again, places for practice, but also I would say it's a legitimate place for wildlife photography, but don't try and pass it off as being in the wild when you photograph something that's there. Um, the great places. There are people who consider it cheating. Um, some people always tag them to say it's in a a zoo or a reserve or something like that when they photograph there. Uh, so yeah, chimpanzee in, I think that was Laura Park uh, in Tenerife. Um, I wish I knew what type of bird that was. I think I've got it noted somewhere, I just don't have it noted down for the presentations on there. But again, that enabled me to practice composition and you can see what I've done uh, with it, if I get my mouse, I've got those rules in there, the strong diagonal, the rule of thirds, the necks on the third line, the eye, a little bit above the third line, but not much on there, uh, and that shallow depth of field separating it from the background uh, with that. And same with this, um, and this goose. Um, and it, it does mean with the zoos and the wildlife parks, you can get, typically you can get closer than you would in the wild on these. So yeah, it's worth, worth going. And Chester Zoo is a, is a, great, a great location uh, on, uh, on there. I know a few people, I think it was Andy last week posted a few images from there, some nice shots. At some point I must go over there and, uh, and do some. But yeah, if all else fails, then let's just cheat. You can photograph wildlife in the studio, but you may need an assistant to wrangle the animals. And I've had um, wildlife nights here at the studio on a few occasions. And once we're out of this corona situation, I'd love to uh, organize another one, uh, a wildlife night, uh, perhaps in conjunction with, um, with Rick. So we've got a couple of shooting areas on there, but that's gonna have to wait. Uh, maybe a year or so before we can do things like that again. Uh, it does help having somebody to uh, corral the, the wildlife and to hold it, um, maybe even be part of the image as we, we have here uh, with uh, a couple of models um, holding the snake, my uh, temptation theme shot. Uh, of course, get, the important thing is get the temperature right because if you get the temperature too hot, you know, the model might be forced to take all the clothes off um, because it's too warm. Sorry, another one of the bad jokes. Sorry, Kev, he does say in the chat he's definitely not responding to my jokes tonight. Uh, don't blame you. And again, this is pure cheat. It's uh, definitely not a, um, uh, not a real camel. It's not even a real desert. It's a model on a model. A model camel on the, uh, the body of a model on there. And I've done this a few times to create interesting shots. We call this one Howling at the Moon. This one, however, is a real spider uh, on the back of the model. And I'd, I'd love to do that one again. That's a, a shoot I'd like to do again. Um, interesting results. And then, of course, when you do get good at faking it, um, uh, then people will never know the difference. So just so that you know exactly how good I am at faking these images, here is a picture of a toucan photographed in the Amazon, uh, the real thing. And I, uh, I faked uh, a similar shot in the studio and you'll never know the difference. No one will be able to tell the difference, would they? Would they? Oh, well, maybe. Um, well, I'm going to leave the final word on this. Sorry about all the bad jokes. This one does work better with a live audience rather than 
me just wittering on at a camera. But the final word on uh, wildlife photography, I will leave to my uh, traveling bear who has one question uh, or one statement to make. And with that, I have finally got to the end of the How Not to Shoot Wildlife series. So let's have a look at some of your uh, wildlife images over in Lightroom. Let me head over to Lightroom on here and get this set up and then I'll swap over. Right. So there we go. We're in uh, Lightroom now. Uh, and this was the little bit I hadn't set up before. I used the uh, color labels to distinguish all the um, wildlife ones from the, uh, the non-wildlife images uh, on there. And that was what I needed to do. So let's develop module, full screen. And let's talk about some of these. This one from uh, Richard Lovelock. Uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant image of, I'm guessing, a field mouse uh, on there. Absolutely tack sharp uh, on that. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to highlight it and say thumbs up. Well done, uh, uh, Richard, on that one. Go on, I'll let you see it full screen. It's worthy of being shown full screen and high resolution, that one. So, again, I think this also, yeah, also Richard's uh, on there, a wild cat. Uh, what I really like about this one is the use of the bokeh, um, uh, foreground, out of focus, background, out of focus. It, the, that shallow depth of field, your eyes just really focusing in on the eyes and the mouth uh, of the wildcat uh, on there. And it's uh, a lovely image on that. Again, uh, nothing I would want to change on there, Richard. Uh, this one's from Peter, and um, uh, it's not perfectly sharp, uh, which he said was partly due to the lens, but mainly I think is due to Facebook uh, on that. Um, two squabbling birds on a uh, on a wing mirror, and I, I quite like that. Uh, nice capture. It might, if the resolution you've got, Peter, will warrant it. It might warrant a slightly tighter crop on there. The trouble is, if you go into what would be my natural crop, you it's a bit harder to see what they're actually sitting on. So would something like that. That would probably work. I don't think we can come down. No, I think it just needs that little bit to help sell the idea of the window on there uh, with that. That would be my sort of crop with it uh, on that one. Uh, from Bill, uh, who tends to watch these but uh, doesn't um, comment. This is his, uh, his puffins. And why does everybody manage to get them with the fish in the mouth, and I've never managed that um, on there. But lovely shot, Bill, on, on that. Um, nice shallow depth of field with it. I might be tempted cropping just tight, slightly, because of that bit of white up there, and I think that would help a little bit. And because I was cropped to the image rather than to anything else, I'd be tempted to do something like that, which I think will help that one better because what I've done there is remove the bright areas which are drawing you out from the, uh, from the center uh, of the image on that. Um, the Gorilla, again by Bill, let's have a look. Just feels as though it's on a tilt, this one. I just want it feels like I ought to be in that. That edge at the top bothers me, but I don't know why. Can't think of anything better, any other way around it. No, I think it's fine. Just I, maybe that just slight tilt. Maybe it was the um, yeah. It that's why it's the tilting um, 
plant there that makes it look it's, as though it's tilted. So, so that would be the crop on there with that. Again by Bill, this, um, there's a couple of uh, fighting seals. One appears to have come off worse on there. Again, Bill, I'd be tempted just to tighten the crop just slightly on here. And I would be, this is one where I try to go for the symmetry, I think, with it. Or if you were trying to do the third, would you? Eh. No, I think symmetry uh, on that one. So that you end up with something like that. I'm not doing it perfect, but to somewhere like that with it would be my, uh, my preferred crop on there. Not much else I want to add to it. And I've got to give you kudos for this one. Um, how you got that one like that, I will never know. But what a lovely image uh, on that. Um, I might be tempted just to enhance the blue a fraction. Oh, not like that. What am I doing? Not even on the tone curve, I meant. No. Come on, Ian, where is it? Colour, that's the one. And what I want to do is the blue and the saturation. Just bringing it up. Hmm, maybe it's a little bit more on the cyan. No, not much on there. Right, okay, why have I... Right, okay, HSL, I can do it better on here. I'll use that. Sorry, you should be full screen so you can see what I'm doing. I can then grab a colour and bring it up just a little bit on there. And it was the blue. It was the blue I needed to do it on. Just a little bit on there and maybe open those shadows up a fraction. Um, I would go something like that. Maybe. Let's just have a look at the original. Original after. It's a little subtle. Um, but I, I would just make a little change like that to it, Bill. It would be my, my preference. But it's, um, uh, it's a nitpick, really. It's a lovely image. I love the expression on the bird uh, on there. It works well. Uh, James with a, a silhouette of a pigeon, um, believe, on, on a phone. Um, which, again, I just wanted to point out. You don't necessarily need big expensive gear to be able to do some wildlife photography and to create interesting images. So really like that one, James. Hope you, you, you see that. Right, now, Andy, Andy Grady. This was a, a bit of a debate in the, uh, the forum about whether the color version or the black and white version is, uh, is best. Color or black and white. And everyone was plumping was going for the um, uh, for the colour one. I just have a feeling, and I haven't tried this out yet, I have a feeling that a little bit of a change to the black and white could make it work. So, what does it need? What it needs is, I think, a little bit more clarity on it, a bit more of the texture bringing out, and most of all, that contrast in there. And I think with that sort of thing, um, maybe even taking the blacks down, well, not too much, I don't want to take them too far. Something like that, the black and white might work because we're now concentrating on that texture in there with it. Uh, there's something like that. No, what am I doing? Not dehaze. So, before and after. I think that sort of change will make the black and white work um, with it. So have a think about that one, Andy, and um, um, then decide between perhaps that and the black and white on there. That was my thoughts on it. Now, what would happen if I did the same on the colour version? 
doesn't, I don't think it works quite as well with the colour, that sort of technique. So undo, undo that. You might be able to do something similar on here uh, with a bit more texture on there. And perhaps a little bit more on the clarity. Mm. Maybe, I don't know uh, with that. But I think the black and white can be made to work was what I wanted to, uh, to say with that. Right, uh, John Bamber, who I mentioned uh, previously, um, uh, John's off grid at the moment, so he won't be watching live. But this was a, a shot that he spent a while setting up, waiting for this. Oh, um, it's not a pole cat. He did say in the uh, um, uh, when he posted the image, and I didn't meant to make a note of it. I would just say this needs a little bit more on the exposure on there, just a little tad more, perhaps just the shadows up a little bit. But that is a cracking shot, really sharp. And that's where the patience of sitting on the location and waiting and waiting um, uh, pays off uh, to get the shot. So well done, John, on there. And the next sort of set I wanted to talk about was because John used the technique that I was talking about on the previous um, slide, uh, previous week, about going to manual mode and setting the exposure. And what he did was he was um, photographing these rocks. He got his exposure set by photographing this tire, first of all. Uh, and once he knew the exposure was set for that, so he could see the detail on the black, was there, and so long as the light didn't change, it then meant it didn't matter where the birds were, whether they were flying on a blue sky like those, uh, or whether they were landed and on the uh, with a a, uh, a green brown background uh, on them, the exposure for the bird would be correct because it was done in manual mode. Uh, so I wanted to share those just to talk about that technique. Uh, as an example of the technique that I talked about last week uh, on there. Uh, from Mike Ashcroft, Mike was one of the people I challenged to, to post something, and he posted, uh, well, I've talked about some of his other images, this one of a crab. And again, great to see he's used the technique I talked about before, getting down at eye level with your subject on there. Lovely shot, Mike. I hope you, uh, hope you watch this. Uh, and another one, a great one of um, crocodile uh, or alligator, alligator actually, isn't it? Um, and he said he was the one who threw the threw the fish. To be honest, I wouldn't want to be that close to uh, anything with teeth like that. The only thing I would say about this, Mike, is possibly a square crop on it. So one to one crop on that, and line it up in the middle. Yeah, not quite. There we go, in the middle. Maybe something like that. Does it require a little bit more exposure? Maybe uh, on it, and perhaps just a tad more on contrast, not much, to something like that. And I'm going to bring the highlights down on that fish so we can see a bit more of the detail on it. So something like that as a little bit of feedback for you, Mike, on there, but great image. And same here, nice shot with the butterfly uh, on a vase. Very similar sort of setup to, uh, to what I did um, that, um, on the one I talked about. Bill sharing one of his deer uh, shots. Um, I find the other deer in there a little bit distracting. I don't know whether I can remove them in Lightroom, I'm just going to have a go and see whether I can. I don't think I'm going to be able to. Can I do it? Can I get rid of it up there? Oh, almost. I just need to do that edge on there. Yep, that's done it. And on there. <clears throat> so something like that, I think, helps keep the attention on the stag. Uh, without all the other uh, items in the background on there. But nice shot, uh, Bill. Well done on that. And 
I think that's the last one. Yep. Okay, so let's head back over. I'll have a look what's been posted in the comments while I've been in Lightroom uh, on here. Ah, right, okay. So uh, Richard Lovelock saying it was a harvest mouse rather than a field mouse. Um, and the night, uh, it's a tern, Arctic tern, yes, on there. Pine martin, right, was the, uh, was the creature. Yep, thank you for that, uh, Andy, uh, on, uh, on there. So that's, that's it for feedback on images. Uh, have we got anything new in chat, comment-wise, question-wise? Don't think we have. Um, I am not set up for checking the uh, Facebook group tonight. Anything that was new, I'll, uh, I'll talk about next week. So that brings me to uh, the wrap-up. Um, don't disappear just yet, because at the end of the wrap-up, I'm just going to talk about the next few weeks of live streams and what's happening with them. Uh, thanks everyone for taking part. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you have, if you found it useful, please subscribe, please comment, please like, and please share. Let me talk about next week and then the subsequent weeks. Next week is going to be predominantly uh, talking about your 12020 challenge images. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the slideshow, uh, animated slideshow of your 20 images, uh, which I will play in. I'm then going to have a look at some of the images, not all of them, in Lightroom and perhaps uh, make a few comments on, uh, on those. If you found that helpful, and you've got any comments, things you've learned through doing the exercise of the 12020, and you want to drop me a note during the week uh, about that, I can then include that as part of the, um, um, uh, the evening. Um, because of that, I want to try and, I keep trying to tie in what we post in the Facebook group with what's coming up on the Sunday. Um, what I'd like, people to post this week in the uh, the Facebook group is images from lockdown, from anything from the 23rd of March onwards. Um, I'd encourage you to do those. Things perhaps that you maybe wouldn't have done other than because of lockdown or that were inspired by lockdown or have something to do with what's happened in the world, whether it's... Um, inspired by it or something that you've been able to do as soon as you got released from it. Share an image with a story to do with COVID-19, how that's affected your photography. That's going to be the theme this week in the Facebook group. And I'll share some of the, um, uh, the best of those uh, next time. So next time, it's the 12020 challenge. As I say, uh, I'll have the thing get up um, scheduled fairly soon. Now, the weeks after that, I've not got the, um, the icons, thumbnails for them yet, but let me tell you what the, the, the forthcoming weeks are going to be. Next week, 12020. The week after that, I'm going to do a session which is predominantly to do with travel photography, but I'm looking at just two aspects of travel photography. Uh, and that is seascapes and photographing boats. And one of the reasons for, uh, for doing that uh, is hopefully to draw in some of the cruise uh, members that, I'm, uh, that have joined my mailing list or uh, that I'm in contact with because of the cruisers to try and get some extra people in on here, try and make it relevant to them so that they've got images that they can share as part of it. So that's going to be uh, that uh, the week after next. The week after that, I am going to do an Art Nude special. I've got some videos that I hope I can actually play in. I had a sound problem recording uh, a couple of training videos uh, the, other, the other week. 
uh, on Art Nude that I'd recorded specially for this special. Uh, but I, for that one, I will set up an area, we'll get an area set up on my website where you can post any Art Nude images that you've got and want to share. So I know there's a few of you on here who, um, who do that kind of work. Uh, so that one will be a, a special. Uh, you will have to be registered with YouTube and logged into your YouTube account to verify your age on that. And I am allowed to, to post and do YouTube videos on that theme, so long as I jump through the right hoops and mark it as being 18 plus and mature content and all that. So just be aware of that. For those of you who watch this, who can't, who don't comment, I want you to be aware now uh, that you will need that YouTube account. And so you've got a couple of weeks to try and get set up with that. Um, and the way to know if it all works is if next week you can comment uh, in the chat, you'll know that your account's there uh, and you'll need to set yourself up so that you are not blocked from mature content as well uh, within YouTube. So worth checking that one out and giving you notice of that that coming up. So that's what's happening in the... Um, uh, there, ah, I've just realized yet another error in this. Ignore the flowerscape comments. That's because I was reusing a slide and I didn't change what was at the bottom of it. So thank you for watching, folks. And until next time, keep making great photos. And I'll see you all next week. Bye for now. Right, time for me to record the alternative ending for when there's a cut down version of this. So here goes. Thanks for watching this cut down version of Ian's Studio Live. Uh, the full version has now been moved over to my academy, details of which are over my shoulder. Uh, please think about joining the academy. It's uh, only six pound a month and there's lots of resources in there, things you can download to help your photography, as well as videos and lighting diagrams for studio photographers and all sorts of things like that. So until next time, thanks for watching and keep making great photos. Bye for now. Don't.